It's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak to all of you from the forum of the India Today conclave. The conclave has, within a short span of a few years, developed a well-deserved reputation of excellence in the quality of the discussions it has hosted. I see that I'm in distinguished company today, and it is a particular pleasure because I will be speaking on a topic I feel passionately about, the future of South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, we in South Asia are custodians of an ancient civilization and a rich heritage. The South Asian tapestry is a wonderfully vibrant and colorful weave of races, religions, ethnic communities that bears testimony to the great variations of history which the region has experienced. Our museums and archaeological sites speak of societies that had flourishing trade, agriculture, constructed dwellings, and even universities at a time when the rest of the world dwelt in darkness. The recent archaeological discoveries in Mehrgar in Balochistan show that we have only scratched the surface of the full scope and depth of the vast historical panorama that shapes South Asia. Our region, ladies and gentlemen, is the home to one-fifth of the population of the world and is rich in resources, skills, and production energy. Taken together, South Asia has the potential to become one of the major centers of economic power in the world. Yet, the sad reality is that for most people outside the region, any mention of South Asia evokes images of teeming multitudes swamped in poverty and deprivation. In the early years of a new century, when the global situation as a whole is characterized by flux and rapid change, the peoples of South Asia face a unique and complicated challenge. This challenge consists of envisioning an alternative future for the region. A future that breaks the vicious cycle of poverty, malnutrition, and disease that stalk our people. A future that is built on the foundations of a lasting peace in the region, rather than one in which the search for peace remains an elusive question. A future that sheds the baggage of the past and reflects the true aspirations and hopes of the peoples of the region. I, for one, believe that it is the intellectuals and civil society who must take the lead in endeavoring to define the contours of this vision of the future. They must act as a vanguard of change by resisting the urge to see the future through the prism of the past. What we need is a fresh way of looking at old issues and finding innovative ways to move the process of civilization forward. Having said this, let me share with you my perspective on peace and development in the region, focusing on two main themes. First, establishment of a lasting peace in the region through a dialogue process aimed at the settlement of all outstanding disputes. Second, cooperation for economic development in the region, both on a bilateral basis and within the framework of SARC. With regard to the first element, I will focus on Pakistan-India relations. I will be begin by acknowledging that we may have different perspectives on certain issues. We may have divergent approaches towards addressing certain problems. But our ultimate goal as Pakistanis or Indians has to be the same, to ensure a better, more prosperous, and more secure future for our people. 
In order to achieve this laudable goal, the first and foremost prerequisite is the establishment of a lasting peace in the region. Unfortunately, we are still caught in the vicious cycle of mutual tensions, military confrontations, and high defense budgets. This cycle is no longer sustainable or practical. It must be broken. As leaders and statesmen, intellectuals and media people, politicians and activists, we cannot and must not avoid the responsibility of demonstrating the necessary political will to eliminate the root causes of suspicion and misperception in our region. We must put aside the tarnished legacy of mistrust, bitterness and tension, and weave the commitment to peace into our bilateral relationships. Our people expect nothing less from us. Let us make a solemn pledge not to disappoint them. All of us have a vital stake in the success of this endeavor. We can no longer afford failure. The path of peace, ladies and gentlemen, is never easy. It is often fraught with greater uncertainty and risk than the path of war. Over the past few months, ever since Pakistan and India began the composite dialogue process, Pakistan has demonstrated time and again that it is ready to ch take chances for peace. We have tried to be innovative and think out of the box. We have tried to be flexible. We have tried to redefine the parameters of engagement so that old problems can be addressed in new ways. At the same time, we have reiterated that Pakistan and India can have a better understanding and cooperation only if we confront our long-standing problems, not if we shy away from them or tiptoe around them. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jammu and Kashmir dispute is one such seemingly intractable problem. Pakistan believes that it is the core issue between our two countries. We also believe that it is a dispute that can be resolved and resolved amicably and fairly. But in order to achieve this, all parties to the dispute, Pakistan, India, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir must demonstrate the will to address the issue sincerely with the objective of seeking honorable solution based on mutual respect and accommodation. It is also important for all sides to acknowledge that Jammu and Kashmir issue is not about territories or ideologies. It is a human problem. Kashmiris have been denied their fundamental right of self-determination. Let me dwell for a minute on the phrase fundamental right. What this implies is that the right of self-determination is the right of the Kashmiri people as human beings. It is an inherent right. India, Pakistan or any third country did not confer it on them and it cannot be taken away. It is for this reason that Pakistan continues to emphasize the need to associate the Kashmiri people with the Pakistan-India peace process. Like people anywhere in the world, Kashmiris value their freedom and basic rights. When these were denied to them, they waged a struggle. When their peaceful struggle met with violence and repression, they did what all desperate people do. They fought back with all means at their disposal. To dismiss the entire Kashmiri freedom struggle as cross-border terrorism is an oversimplification that would be almost droll if its consequences weren't so tragic. tragic. Similarly, the temptation to bracket the issue as a subset of the larger global problem of terrorism may be, at best, disingenuous and at worst, 
dangerous. We all know what the facts are. We also know that irrespective of the legal hair splitting and bureaucratic posturing, India's liberal conscience deep down knows that it has a case to answer on Kashmir. A fulsome articulation of this realization should be crossing of the Rubicon on the road to peace. Let me clarify, ladies and gentlemen, that from Pakistan's perspective, any serious attempt to resolve the Kashmir dispute does not hinge on apportioning blame or demanding concessions that are unreasonable or unjust. In our meetings with the Indian leadership over the past year, both President Musharraf and I emphasized the need to move away from conditioned reflexes and explore fresh ways to seek just and durable solutions to all outstanding issues, including the issue of Jammu and Kashmir. Let us break through the shackles of the past and bridge the trust deficit once and for all. Ladies and gentlemen, the European experience teaches us that provided the will exists, centuries of bad blood can fall by the wayside and bitter enmities can give way to peace, friendship and cooperation. The challenge before us is to reach a similar level of amity without being forced to learn these lessons through further trials of fire and cataclysmic conflict. During the recent visit to Pakistan of the Indian External Affairs Minister, Mr. Natwar Singh, the government of Pakistan and India took a historic decision to allow travel across the LOC by bus between Sirinagar and Muzaffarabad, which was a long-standing demand of the Kashmiri people on both sides of the LOC. In deference to the wishes of the Kashmiri people, it has been agreed that no passports or visas will be required for the crossing. We believe that the Singapore Muzaffarabad bus service is a humanitarian conference building measure, while which, which will contribute towards the alleviation of the problems of the Kashmiri people. Let me now, ladies and gentlemen, turn to my second theme, which is economic cooperation. I will begin by saying that regional and bilateral processes are mutually reinforcing. Under SARC, we are coming together in trade with SAFTA. That is, in fact, an MFN plus. During Pakistan's chairmanship of SARC, we have been able to energize SARC. We have broadened SARC's agenda to include energy cooperation, move decisive, decisively to address issues in the social sector. South Asia must position itself to benefit from the globalization process. This warrants a renewed focus on regional cooperation. On the bilateral plane too, there is a lot that can be done. Pakistan is of the view that both India and Pakistan can gain by cooperating in the field of energy. The proposed grass pipeline projects linking India through Pakistan to the enormous reserves of West and Central Asia would be a huge economic CBM. We envisage this as a standalone project of great significance. We hope that you would appreciate the significance of this gesture we made in offering India an energy corridor. It is our strong conviction that this would create mutual linkages and interdependencies, which can form the basis of closer overall relations between countries in the region. Discussions on bilateral trade need to move beyond acrimony and the blame game to a more thoughtful and objective analysis. It is important to acknowledge that India has a huge advantage in terms of balance of trade. Therefore, 
there is need to identify reasons that make it difficult for Pakistan to get market access in India. We hope that the Economic Experts Committee, which has just met in Delhi, would be able to deal with these issues effectively. It is extremely important to create a level playing field and facilitate more private sector interaction. Ladies and gentlemen, our own policies accord the highest priority to economic development. We have succeeded in bringing our economic growth rate around 7%. In fact, this year we expect it to be slightly higher. And within a couple of years, we are targeting an 8% growth rate. All our macroeconomic indicators are positive and upbeat. We are also working on important infrastructure projects and stimulating economic growth while addressing the issues in the social sector and human development. Our stock exchanges are good indicators of the vibrancy of our economy. We strongly believe that the future of economic cooperation in the region is bright. Pakistan and India are capable of leading South Asia to new horizons of economic development and making this century a South Asian century. The Pakistan of today and tomorrow is not the Pakistan of yesterday. Tomorrow's Pakistan is a Pakistan of hope and opportunity. We believe that our region's real strength lies in the inherent talent and capability of our peoples. South Asians are resilient and enterprising, intelligent and industrious. They have tremendous potential. What they have lacked is the opportunity to allow this potential to bloom for the benefit of their respective countries and the region as a whole. It is our responsibility to ensure that they are given a conducive environment to become everything they are capable of and more. Ladies and gentlemen, I began this address by saying that South Asia faces the challenge of envisioning an alternative future for itself. Fundamental change in both thinking and behavior necessitates making bold choices and taking difficult decisions. These choices take on a special significance in the context of South Asia, where the burden of history is disproportionately heavy and fuels a never-ending cycle of distrust and antagonism. In this search for an alternate future of peace and progress, it is reasonable to expect that India will shoulder a responsibility proportionate to its size. In today's world, defined as it is by globalization, interdependence and integration, it is imperative for all states to draw strength from the support and cooperation of their neighbors. This is more so for a large state aspiring to play a greater role. Great power status is not solely a function of physical indices of power, nor can it be gained through certain multilateral mechanisms. A basic and important step on the road to achieving recognition as a global player lies through fostering peace, harmony, and friendship within the region. Pakistan is genuinely working towards creating a peaceful, stable, and prosperous neighborhood. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, let me say that in this age of intertwined destinies and common futures, let us vow to make the 21st century a century of peace and prosperity for South Asia. Let us reclaim our glorious heritage. Let us celebrate our diversity and turn it into a source of strength rather than division. Let us prove to the world that South Asia is capable of seizing the moment. We owe this much to our future generations. I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.
May I take the privilege of asking you the first question as the moderator? A lot has happened since last year in terms of progress. You've started the bus service, cultural links have improved, some trade has opened up. Does this mean that you see substantive process, progress on Kashmir? What is it that you would want to do to advance the peace process in, in very specific terms? Well, as I've said today, and I, we've, we've said before also, I think the confidence-building measures and the dialogue we've initiated at all levels, through officials and through back channels, is helping create, create a conducive atmosphere to move along in our relationship. But as I've also stated, that progress on our relationship has to recognize the ground realities. Pakistan wants relations with India to be better. We want to create an atmosphere which will be a win-win for both countries. In this context, uh, one example I would give was the energy corridor we offered to your government. I think that will be one of the major turning points in our relationship. The reason that is the case is it is a win-win for all. For India, because you will get much needed energy at a, in a cost-effective, reliable way. For Pakistan, because we also are benefiting from this pipeline in terms of getting energy for our own needs. And doing it together is much more efficient than doing it separately. And then it will be a win-win for the energy supplier. But as I mentioned, it creates linkages and interdependencies and builds trust and interaction. Similarly, the bus service, which the foreign ministers of both countries announced a couple of days ago, will be a step in the right direction. But we have to move all this in tandem with move, making progress on the Kashmir issue. This is a complicated issue. And we believe that progress on this issue will influence progress on other parts of our relationship. I think we need to approach it with courage, leadership, magnanimity, sincerity, and flexibility. It is not going to be easy. But I think certainly Pakistan is committed to moving in the right direction. We are encouraged with the initial uh, uh, progress we have made as a result of the CBMs, but much more needs to be done. Let's proceed on this journey with full vigor and sincerity. But sir, do you Thank see you. that some progress has taken place in Kashmir in the last, on talks on Kashmir Absolutely. in the last year? Well, the bus service, the bus service is the one tangible area where clearly the people of Kashmir will benefit. But more needs to be done. Thank you.